we're looking for is the market really up on their position and the higher they go up the more likely they are to start distributing and that eventually oversaturates demand G'day folks and welcome to an on-chain update for the 28th of April. Now today we're covering a topic that I'm sure many people in the audience are quite keen to understand and that is how we at Check on Chain actually track Bitcoin cycle tops. Now of course it's one thing to make a chart turn orange and blue and say look it's the top. It's another thing to actually have those metrics and those tools really explaining a meaningful market mechanic, something that's really underlying and actually driving what forms a top. Uh, it's one thing to just kind of make it a color, but really we want to make sure that the dynamics that we're describing make sense and they're actually telling us a story that is meaningful and uh, and really relevant to pay attention to and track moving forward. Now, this is actually the first uh, out of four different questions that we covered in our Substack Q&A. Um, so we do these once a month and the idea is to get a feel for what our subscribers are paying attention to, what they want to understand more about. There was a couple of questions there about understanding different metrics and we've just launched our masterclass series um, with a, a, a the first topic on the Realize Cap and MVRV, exploring things from first principles. So one of those questions was, how do we track cycle tops, right? It's a question that a lot of people will have. There was a lot of questions about how Bitcoin fits into the macro economy at this point in time. Um, now, whilst we're students of Bitcoin and on-chain, we also spend a lot of our time studying the macro side. So we do like to share our outlook just so people understand how we're thinking about markets. There was a lot of questions about ETFs. We're seeing one going live in Hong Kong. We're seeing those in the, in the US slowing down on their inflows and even seeing a bit of an outflow. Um, GBTC continues to see outflows. So just our thoughts about that macro scale. What are the US and global ETFs doing? And there was another couple of questions about the on-chain tools that I actually wake up every day and check. And really, why? Why did we build them? Why do we actually look at them every day? And what are they telling us about the market dynamics? So if you are interested in that kind of content, make sure you head over to checkonchain.com, check out our Substack. Um, we've got heaps of great stuff going on over there. And you know we're putting out multiple posts a week at, this, at, the, at the moment and uh, really enjoying doing it at the same time. So as always, before we get started, please do give us a like, a share, and a subscribe. It helps this channel grow and really get to more people. Um, we like sharing our thoughts on the market. We love Bitcoin. We love the way that the data moves and all the different stories that it can tell us. Um, and you know, sharing that is, a, is something that we're really excited about. And if you have any comments or feedback along the way, drop them into the comment section below. We read all of them um, and we use that to kind of iterate and, and get better at what we do overall. So uh, without further delay, let's get stuck right into the analysis. Okay, so here we are in the check on chain suite. And as I mentioned, we're looking for cycle tops and bottoms. Now, for the most part, this session is going to be tailored more for the hodler kind of cohort. We're not looking at trying to pick Pico tops. We're not trying to predict the future. What we're trying to do is look for things where the market has reached some kind of extreme. And most importantly, we're looking for confluence. We want lots and lots of metrics to have hit some kind of cycle extreme. Um, and that tells us that there's probably a high degree of confidence that something isn't right anymore. Now, where I'm actually going to start is down here in our profit and loss metrics. And I want to start by explaining the mechanics of what actually establishes a top. So we're going to load up our net realized profit loss momentum. I want to look at the profit and the loss components first, because these two go hand in hand and uh, we'll explore the mechanics moving forward. Now, when we talk about realized profit, these are coins that are being moved by people who acquired them at a cheap price and are now selling them at a more expensive price. And the reason we can do this is we price stamp coins. We can actually see when a coin was acquired, track its cost basis, and then when it's sold for a profit, this here is profit momentum. So there's a few mechanics here. I won't go into too many of the details. What we're looking for is a significant uptick in profit taking. And as you can see, profit taking tends to peak roughly around the point in time when the market peaks. And this is because this is sell side pressure. This is actually what establishes tops. It's that extra supply. Now remember, Bitcoin tends to go on pretty significant runs. So if it's coming up with a large profit, it's usually coming from a low cost basis. If it's coming from a low cost basis, it's probably been held for a long time. So quite often you'll see things like coin days destroyed, long-term supply, all of these things will uptick or downtick accordingly um, when you've got realized profit taking place. So we can see that this profit taking is actually what establishes these local and eventually global peaks. And we had a fairly substantial amount of profit coming in as we got up to the ETF peak at about 73K. Um, so a very, very meaningful uh, uptick. This is now cooled off. That's what we usually want to see. Um, if we just pull it back on the modern era, 2017 has a lot of good examples of this. 
Um, very often we'll get these peaks and it will hit one of these um, corrections, pull back, and then we get another run, more profit gets taken, and so on and so forth, until eventually the market just gets oversaturated. Now, if we move on to the loss side of the equation, we'll again stick it on our modern era because that's really what's relevant. We don't care too much about the early history. Losses are the opposite. Now, strangely enough, losses are actually what tells us that the bull is dead because at the end of the day, lots of people, those profit taking, they're being sold to people with a new cost basis. And that cost basis is much higher than where the original coin came from. So what we can see is that through these corrections, people buy high and then they sell low. They buy high and then they sell low. So losses actually tend to pick up the lows of these corrections because they're when people are capitulating out. It's like a micro capitulation. But we get correction, correction, correction. They get bigger and bigger. And then this is what we call the shot across the bow. This is when the top has now been established because lots and lots of people bought way too many coins at way too high of a price. Notice that losses subsided. And then in this instance, they didn't. We had a massive regime shift. Next thing you know, you've got people who are panicking. They're, they're, the market is too top heavy. We'll touch on that in a second. You can see it here in May, 2021. This was telling us that this sustained period of loss, it wasn't a correction. There was something much nastier under the surface and people were now really starting to panic. So in many ways, losses are actually what tells us that the bull market may have peaked. It's the profits that actually establish the peaks, but it's the losses that tell us that it is probably over. So now that we've got some of those mechanics out of the way, we've also got this section here called tracking top heavy markets. And there's two charts here, which we built, um, shipped and talked about in our first uh, Substack report, uh, talking specifically about uh, top heavy markets. And what we're looking at here is the percent supply and profit in the oscillator down the bottom. And this is kind of the inverse. It's not looking at the amount of coins in loss. It's looking at how much the percent supply and profit has pulled back from its cycle peak. Now, what we can see is that these are garden variety corrections. You know, we get 17%, we get 22%, we get 23%, 18, something odd percent of coins going into loss. And you can actually see that our current market cycle isn't too different to that. However, when we get that top heavy um, point, remember, this is when those losses absolutely rip higher. People are trapped. They start to panic. And that is what actually breaks sentiment and perpetuates the bear cycle. Notice how this is very, very different. 2019, very, very different mechanics. Um, and same here, that May, that May self, we had a bunch of these little corrections and then it wasn't okay. This is a top heavy market. Too many people went from in profit, having a great time, loving life, to not having much fun at all. And that is what creates the panic and actually is the sign that the bull market is probably dead. Now, of course, the short-term holders, by and large, are the ones that actually buy these tops. Now, I'm aware that my head's in the way, so let me just quickly hide that video. Um, so what we can see here, this is short-term holder supply in orange, short-term holder supply in loss, shown in red. So you can see these garden variety corrections. We get above the average, not quite up to the plus one standard deviation, garden variety corrections, and then bang, top heavy market. Once we've got too many buyers trapped at too high of a price, this is what creates the bear cycle that follows. Now, of course, we can have a bottom heavy market as well. As we came up here in 2018, notice how price barely got up to the top of the range, but short-term holders in loss collapsed. This is actually the opposite. This is a bottom heavy market telling us lots of coins just went from in loss to in profit. People capitulated, realized those losses, someone else with stronger hands bought them and we flip over, right? Cycle goes the other direction. 2021, here's that May sell-off. One of many reasons we believe May was the end of the bull. Um, that sell-off really killed sentiment and we were pretty much top heavy throughout all of 2022. Now we had a bit of a scare here in August, but for the most part, these look quite like, somewhat like garden variety corrections. Now I will refer you back to our Substack as we explored some of the macro headwinds, which are really important to keep in mind. I can't go into the full details here because we just don't have the time, but there are other, even though we've got a, a substantial uptick in coins in loss, we're not top heavy as it stands, but there's a few levels that we need to just be aware of. And with some of these macro headwinds, they're the kind of things that can start to create 
um, you know, what, what can be a much longer drawdown overall. So that's really exploring a lot of the mechanics, right? How does a top get formed? What are the things we're looking for to actually establish that? Now, as you can see, a lot of those are trying to track for that transition point when the top has been established. How do we start to go, well, I wanna be prepared for when that top starts being established. What are some tools that we can use to track? So I'm just gonna show you the on-chain originals, which is basically a collection of all of the OG pricing models from, you know, these are the ones that had the most on-chain work put into them. Um, and also just a really, really great set of uh, pricing models. I wanna open up our signal tops and bottoms. And I wanna open up Nurpal by cohort, because I think this is another really interesting one. And we'll do Nurpal before we do the uh, cycle tops and bottoms. So let's go again to our modern era. I'm gonna turn off everything except price, the true mean price, realized price, vaulted and the MVRV metric. And let's stick this onto a 100 axis. Now we've got a full story. So talking about just market cycles, this is to try and set the scene. How do we know when we're starting to get toasty? When are we getting the markets getting a bit frothy? And again, a lot of those red patches you saw in previous charts, you'll see that they actually show up here as well. So realize price, we intersect towards the bottom, right? Which is you know, obviously not what we're trying to deal with right now. Once we get up to the true market mean, this is the, I mean, statistically speaking, it's the middle, uh, long-term mean and long-term uh, median of one um, in terms of how much price oscillates around it. This was developed by myself and David Puell as part of Cointime Economics. But notice as we get up to the top level here, this is the vaulted price, which is also from Cointime Economics. And then we have the MVRV plus one standard deviation. Keep that idea in mind, we'll come back to it. As we intersect this, it's usually around breaking previous all-time high. Same over here, as we came up and broke through to new all-time highs, we entered between these two green channels. Note that we can keep going, and that's the next thing we're gonna do. We're gonna say, we're now in the euphoria zone. Once we're up in this greens channel, we're typically in the euphoric zone of the bull. You can see that we've intersected it, pulled back a little bit, but we're still within a reasonable range of what we're gonna call the euphoria zone. And the question is, is this the top? or do we actually have some more juice to keep running? So this is where we're gonna now start looking for market extremes. What we wanna do is really hone in on the zone where things are just getting a little bit too hot, a little bit too toasty, and we wanna look for confluence. In this case, we're looking at Nupal. Now, Nupal is essentially a derivative of MVRV, and it's really describing the unrealized profit or loss, the paper gains or the paper losses held by the market. Now the form of confluence we're looking at here is by cohort. So in orange, we've got our uh, Nupal metric by the total market, so on average. In red, we've got short-term holders, and in blue, we've got long-term holders. So kind of different cross sections of different Bitcoin holder sets. And what we're really looking for is when all of these groups are in a statistically large amount of unrealized profit. So I think about if we gave the coin supply to 100 people. And what we do is we turn up, we rat, they all say that they're diamond hands, but we ratchet up their amount of profit by 100%, 200%, 300%, 400%. You can probably imagine that at some point in time, someone is going to sell. And not only that, everybody knows that at some point someone is going to sell. And it kind of becomes like a game of chicken, where at some point people are so in the money and it's so life-changing that they just have no choice and they just have to take chips off the table. And what you really don't want to do is be the, the first guy off the rank because then you're essentially, you know, you're, you're selling early and it could go from 200 to 300 to 400. But you also don't want to be the last guy where you're waiting for a thousand percent and it only goes to 600 and then sells off from there. So this is kind of the game of chicken that's being played um, in, in the entire market across all assets. We just happen to be able to visualize it for Bitcoin. And what this metric is designed to do is it will flag orange when at least two of these cohorts are now in a statistically significant amount of unrealized profit. Now, the reason why we use these simple statistics is to filter out these earlier peaks, because as you can see, MVRV and Nupal, they can continue to climb and get to high levels, but how do we classify what is extreme? So when two out of three have flagged a plus one standard deviation move, this chart will turn orange. And when all three of them, it will start to turn red. So that's really telling us when things are really toasty. We've got too many people who are in that situation where they're all scratching their head going, oh, this feels like a very, very big green number. I'm probably going to take some chips off the table. 
Now we can obviously bolster this with all sorts of other metrics, um, things that actually tell us, are they taking those profits? We covered that at the start of the video, but that's the concept we're looking for. Is the market really up on their position? And the higher they go up, the more likely they are to start distributing and that eventually oversaturates demand. Now, the second type of confluence is across different market sectors. So that previous one was kind of Bitcoin holders. It was one metric, but across different cohorts. Here, we're actually looking at completely different mechanics within the market. MVRV is showing us when uh, the unrealized profit or loss, similar to Nupal. Sopra is telling us when people are actually locking in significant amounts of profit. The pure multiple tells us when, lot, when miners are making money hand over fist. And reserve risk is telling us when the hodlers are really starting to distribute their positions. So what we're doing is looking at all four of these different metrics and this little colored bar down the bottom will flag as a level of one whenever one of these particular things is hit. And then we have this composite index in white, which essentially tracks the aggregate across all of those. So as we can see, when a bunch of these, when the signal actually gets above 85%, it essentially means that we've got all four of these staying to uptick for a sustained period of time, and it's going to flag orange. It's telling us that we are now getting into the pretty hot zone. Um, and as a result, miners are making money, hodlers are making money, people are taking chips off the table, and the hodlers are divesting their positions. So that's essentially what this metric is capturing, those particular zones. Now, we saw as we came into the 73K peak uh, following the ETFs, we saw that MVRV, so people were holding a pretty meaningful amount of profit. People were actually taking a meaningful amount of profit and very early signs that reserve risk were starting to tick higher, meaning hodlers were divesting their positions. So if we bring that all together, we have a confluence across all four of these sectors at certain times that tell us things are getting pretty warm. Now, again, we're not trying to spot the exact peak or top. We're trying to look at, at points in time when the mechanics are such that top heavy markets start to get formed. Markets rarely like to move into these unstable equilibriums. And that's essentially what these tools are doing. They're trying to spot periods when it is an unstable equilibrium. We have too many people who are too up and those incentives are just not aligned for the market to keep going. So anyway, folks, hopefully you enjoyed that session, really going over some of the mechanics. Um, as I said, check out our Substack where we explore all of these ideas each week in a, in, in a fair bit of depth. Um, we've got a masterclass series running. So if you want to learn how all these metrics actually work and get into the nuts and bolts of it, there's a series there for you. We're also looking at market updates. And again, this was part of our Q&A. So one of those great questions. Um, and thank you to all our subscribers for putting those in. So um, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you've got any questions at all, stick them in the comment section below and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.